Thanks for being with me and for being part of this ever-expanding community from Earls Barton and beyond. Life in all its fullness. So what is it that prevents us from having life in all its fullness? What is it that gets in the way of a true experience of well-being? Well, the answer is surprisingly simple. Ourselves. Or to be even more exact, our cells. The difference is subtle but profound. Let's explore that a bit. We all spend nearly all of our lives telling ourselves stories about ourselves. I, I don't mean that we're consciously um, writing a literal narrative about who we are and where we're going, like someone unable to read without moving their lips. It's the processes of consciousness are a bit more nuanced than that. Our inner realities are made up of assumptions, judgments and commentaries about ourselves, which are so deeply rooted that most of the time we have very little awareness of their existence. A convenient shorthand for these deep internalised messages is simply to think of them as our conditioning. It's our lifelong conditioning that's made us the persons that we take ourselves to be. That's the key thing, that we take ourselves to be. Our childhood experiences in particular, the kind of encouragement or discouragement that we've received, the kind of love or cruelties that have been visited, the kind of love that's been shown to us or the kind of cruelties that have been visited upon us. And then our self-image hardens, confirmed by self-fulfilling prophecies as we negotiate adulthood until the internalised narrative, the stories that we tell ourselves, that narrative takes over fully and we find ourselves somewhat mechanically just simply acting out our self-scripted life stories. So another shorthand for that evolutionary process is the formation of the ego. We all have an ego. We all need to have an ego. It's our vehicle for making the journey through life. The ego helps us to pay the bills to learn what we need to learn to interact with others, to fall in love. The ego is only a problem when we come to believe that, ent that it entirely defines who we are. And then we've merely become a, f a function of our conditioning, which means that we've also become, in a sense, the victim of our life stories, of our life story. So in that state in that condition, uh, we were at the mercy of the invisible internal brainwashing, which constantly whispers its messages. And so we decide, prematurely and mistakenly, who we really are. It's our terrible guilty secret, who we really are. The internal messages maybe go something like this. I'm a depressive. I've never tried hard enough. I'm ill. I'm a loser. I'm not worthy. I'm a fraud. I'm dying. I'm not good enough. Yeah, most of our internalized stories are negative. The secret ones, the ones that we dare hardly share or dare hardly acknowledge to ourselves. Most of them are negative and, and destructive, but, and when they have a swagger about them, I'm a winner, I'm irresistible, I'm totally in charge. They very often turn out to be a desperate attempt to hide the other unbearable story, the one about our weakness and vulnerability, the one that we're terrified is true. I'm sure you can think of people who play it that way as well. So all these stories, all these maps... That's just a, a map. They're all just representations of a, a reality beyond maps. All those maps that threaten to define the territory, they're only partial. They lock us out from the fullness of life. They may well contain vital truths about our development and about our current circumstances, of course. They're a, they are genuine expressions of our 
real wounds, our real hopes, our real fears and real struggles, our life stories and the egos that they produce. So they're not to be dismissed. They're to be honoured and attended to with love and patience. It's it's the grist to the mill. It's what we have to work with. It's our way through. They contain all the clues that we need for our eventual liberation from the many ways in which they limit us. But we don't win our freedom by the denial of who we are or who we have been. Our freedom comes when we wake up to the fact that these identities, gloriously, are only a part of the story. You're more, much more, than you took yourself to be. So meditation is a way of no longer being limited by the stories that we habitually and compulsively tell ourselves. And it manages to do that because it's a kind of Lent. Now, I'm recording this talk in the season of Lent. Uh, it's, it's still Lent, and it feels, we trust, that Easter's going to come. But it feels as though Lent is going to be a very extended Lent this year, perhaps so that we really, really get it and understand what it's trying to teach us. Now, the season of Lent may be a profoundly meaningful period of time for some of you. You may experience it, uh, it as a chance to simplify life, to recenter yourself, to get back in touch with and live from the fundamental truths of being human. To others, I'm sure it might well mean little more than childhood memories of grown-ups encouraging you to feel guilty about something and make amends for it by giving something up. But Lent isn't about making yourself miserable or somehow impoverishing your quality of life, your material life, because in some mysterious way it's good for your soul. But like all observances arising from the wisdom traditions, it can either be mechanically followed just for form's sake, or we can enter into it with our whole being, making ourselves available once more for transformation. Lent reveals some of the fundamental and universal patterns of being human and of human well-being. Now, every year during Lent, I turn to an anthology collected especially for this season. It's called The Desert. Uh, rather wonderful, it's being put together by uh, a man called John Moses, who I think used to be the Dean of St. Paul's. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but uh, what better name for someone who's introducing us to the desert and how it can help us to be more real. We have to understand the desert as the place that we're frightened to go into, whether it be an external desert or the fearful wilderness inside that we would much, much rather avoid. So Moses, uh, that's John, John Moses, the editor of this uh, brilliant anthology, um, The Desert, an anthology for Lent. He sees the journey through the desert as something that we will at some point have to undertake, all of us. And he describes the journey as having identifiable stages and in a kind of order it's not rigid as i'll talk about later but these stages of the journey through the desert through lent through meditation through our time of global crisis that desert are these so the first is the call of the desert Second is solitude. The third is testing. <clears throat> the fourth is self-emptying. The fifth is encounter. And the sixth is transfiguration. So 
So, so I think we can usefully also understand these stages as a description of the journey that we that we undertake every time we sit down to meditate, renewing our readiness to be well, our readiness to be well, no matter what else might be going on in our lives. So just working through those stages, saying a little something about each of them. The call of the desert is really whatever it is that makes us feel that all is not well. It's whatever occurs to make us realise that something needs to change, and there's plenty of that happening at the moment. If we're ill or miserable or horribly addicted, we will quite rightly try to fix that. Whatever the problem is, whatever the specific thing that is making us know that all is not well. And we may or may not succeed in fixing whatever that is. But eventually, either a very specific problem or just a general overwhelming sense of unsatisfactoriness, which is what the Buddha calls dukkha, will lead us, if we listen to it, if it, if it shouts loud enough perhaps, it will lead us into the desert, which might turn out to be the beginning of our meditation practice. In other words, the beginning of our awakening. Solitude. The primary characteristic of the desert experience is solitude. So that's quite different to the isolation that many of us are being recommended to, to practice during this current viral outbreak. Isolation implies a, a cutting off and an unreachability. It also implies a state of being that is profoundly not wished for. But solitude at its heart is chosen and chosen deeply. Solitude's waiting to happen in our lives as an essential to our well-being. So the motivation behind solitude is not a mere wish to escape from the crowd, which is driving you mad, the madding crowd, but rather it's a desire which usually manifests first as a desperate need to slow down, to simplify and to stop so that you can listen to what it's like to be a human being, this particular human being, this specific one. And being apart from the surrounding crowd is, is uh, of much less significance than being able to put some distance between yourself and the crowd of your thoughts. The spaciousness that solitude brings begins to teach you that you're much more than the sum of your thoughts, and so is everyone else. But it's not, believe me, and I'm sure you will, it's not all instantaneous spaciousness and calm. Very far from it. If you've meditated before, you'll know that the first thing you experience, maybe after the initial excitement and glamour of, I'm a meditator, has worn off. The first thing you experience is a bewildering intensification of the internal noise. Those narratives become a cacophony. There's nothing but distraction or obsessive thought, fragmented fantasies, and disturbing emotions all bumping into each other in random motion. It feels chaotic. So that's the great, <coughs> excuse me, that's the great discouragement, uh, the temptation to give up as soon as you've started. It's famously been called the monkey mind. And at first, at first glimpse, it looks completely unmanageable. But this is the testing, remember that stage of the journey through the desert, through Lent through meditation, through the crisis. This is the testing phase of our journey. It's the necessary walking of the tightrope between giving up entirely and moving steadfastly on. The truth is that you've already done the really courageous thing, the one thing necessary. You've been brave enough to face what's causing the distress, the chattering mon monkeys of anxiety and restlessness. The obstacles in your way, the demons, what the first desert monks called the afflictions, 
We cannot begin to heal, to be more well, unless we're first able to sit down in acknowledgement and and acceptance of what we've been carrying and what we've been running away from, both carrying and running away from. Well, the fact that we're carrying and running away from the same thing explains the incredible tension, knots and stress that we can all too often find ourselves in. So the mysterious power of the desert resides in the stripping away of everything that we thought we needed and everything that we believed would keep us safe and well. So in in meditation, we practice voluntarily entering the desert. And so by restricting our the play of our attention to a single point, which is either the breath or the mantra, and I'll say some, give some more detailed instructions about the practice of meditation at the end of this piece. Um, by restricting our attention in that way, we begin the process of unattaching from all the strategies, the props and the support systems that we had thought so utterly essential. So that unfolding process in which we progressively learn to disidentify with our thoughts and with our, and with the afflictions, that's the time of self emptying. The process of no longer identifying with that rush of story and commentary, uh, is the self emptying. So when, when, when we're, um, severely tested, we, we have a choice. We can either cling ever more tightly to the beliefs about ourselves and the deeply grooved strategies which have sort of sort of kept us together. And most of us will cling on for as long as we possibly can. Why wouldn't we? Because fear is so strong. Or we can exercise a kind of creative giving up. This is, again, to go through this process consciously, voluntarily, as a choice, which is all the difference in the world. And then we encounter the question, well, what is there and who are we? If we're no longer sustained by the old life raft, those old stories, the old safety net, and the increasingly rackety scaffolding that we have used to shore up our lives. And it it either takes great desperation or great courage and it's usually both i think to take to follow the course of the voluntary journey into the desert the hard but precious discovery i would say is that it's the only choice it's the only choice that gets us anywhere i'm thinking about after self-emptying, encounter. Um, the possibility of encounter, of meeting, of connecting, of finding something, of knowing something authentically only arises, that possibility only arises when we've travelled this rough road of self-emptying. Until that radical unclenching of the grip, of our grip on the self as a possession, a possession to be defended, until that unclenching is happening. All we will really encounter is who we think we are in an increasingly bewildering hall of mirrors. The ego is the vehicle or the shelter that we need to inhabit wisely if it's not to become our prison. Our fundamental well-being depends on our readiness to open the windows and the doors so that the light can pour in and shine out. Only then can the life-giving dynamic of connection and deep relationship begin to take place. And you may have noticed that people who, who've who learned that um, grace of self-emptying, that, which is a continuous process, it's never finally pulled off and achieved, but people who are on that path of self-emptying are not full of themselves by definition, but they're full of life. But trying to pin down what it is that they've encountered, or which we want to encounter, 
this encounter which makes them such well beings is is to miss the point. We might be tempted to hazard all kinds of guesses about what it is that they've encountered. Enlightenment, God, love, the other. But trying to fix things, trying to name things uh, as finally as that, is precisely what the spirit of well-being joyfully chooses not to do. And the best picture of that that I know, one of the best pictures, is contained in some of my favourite lines of English poetry by William Blake, which he wrote a couple of hundred years ago. He who binds to himself a joy does the winged life destroy. But he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. So I think that Blake's wonderfully simple and wise, um, those, those two things nearly always go together. His verse says as much as can be said, I think. It talks of a loving and joyful encounter, but it's the kind that refuses to take possession of anything. That's the essence. And it, his verse effortlessly reveals that this, this encounter is the very transfiguration that we didn't know we were seeking. So that shift of profound non-possessiveness. Poverty of spirit is one description of it. Non-attachment is the very foundation, the heart, the moving, living, beating heart of well-being. Now, it's vital to bear in mind that, as I said before, that these stages, the call of the desert, solitude, testing, self-emptying, encounter and transfiguration are they don't follow in a a predictable and inevitable uh, pattern or progression as well as stages they're also characteristics so uh, like with the walking of a labyrinth it can feel as though you're back at the start even though you're very near the center Uh, equally you can believe that you're almost at the goal And it turns out that you've barely begun. So in reality, all of these stages or characteristics of our journey are at some level taking place all at once. It's all happening at once, but we have to to make sense of it. We produce a timeline, a story. But the fact that it is happening all at once makes sense for a journey that you undertake by discovering the complete stillness within and between all beings. Transfiguration is the last of those stages and characteristics that John Moses talked about. And I would say this about transfiguration, that the less said about it, the better. As all the wisdom teachers have insisted, Experience is the best teacher. So all that we can do is keep our practice as simple and as humble as we can. And as as free from our personal agenda as we can, which is the supremely challenging thing. The change that we want, the benefits that we inevitably look for, but the change that we would design with our limited information and understanding is not the one that's going to work. The creative self-surrender that's at, that's at the heart of meditation practice and of Lent itself is at the core of any authentic experience of well-being. Interestingly, it's not now just our meditation practice that acts as a kind of Lent for us. I think that's becoming increasingly, blindingly obvious to many of us in the moment that we find ourselves in. It's the whole of our suddenly unrecognisable 
social and cultural reality, which is also at the core of our authentic experience of well-being. And it's it's this which is our our, our encounter with the um, this this change reality, the nature of that change reality, the nature of that encounter is going to be our part of our practice of well being. As the virus outbreak transforms the entire world into a desert of unfamiliarity, but one that is full of potential. So let's walk through it as wisely and attentively as we can. And of course, practicality, experience, practicality, starts with practice. So we need to learn or remind ourselves how to follow this practice of meditation. But for the moment, I'll I'll do a piece to camera uh, about the practice of meditation. Thanks for being with me. Thanks for being part of the Earls Barton Library group. And thanks for being part of this group represented behind me. This, uh, this community of love.